Hello and welcome to the first of this SEA sessions. Um, so I guess to start with, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Richard Hughes. I'm the Partner Strategy Director at SEA 365. And the purpose of this, uh, the SEA sessions, is really to talk about our partners. And by our partners, I mean partners from large and small, ISVs to SIs all around the world. And the idea is to really put a spotlight on them and the great work that they do every day uh, with customers all around the world. So today, I'm very pleased to be able to say that we've uh, got Blue Fort with us. Uh, so Bjorn, good to meet you. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Richard. Thank you very much. So, um, so Bjorn, today we're going to talk about something that's very close to, uh, to your chest, which is uh, the subscription world. Um, so if, uh, if anybody's out there and want to uh, write a post about what subscriptions you're, you're using today, please do, um, or clean ones anyway. Uh, and then, uh, so Bjorn, tell me a little bit more about Bluefort and about what you guys do. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, so Blueford is a uh, is a hundred percent ISV, um, and we focus a hundred percent on subscription business applications and technologies surrounding the Microsoft and Amazon 65 and, uh, and Power Platform capabilities. And our focus is really to to look at let's say a lead to lifetime approach in subscription management in the subscription economy, in the various ways subscriptions can be handled in in different industries and with our technology and business apps. We really focus on modernizing and automating flows at the same time elevating a great customer experience around it for our partners and customers thanks bjorn so um should we have a look a bit more detail about what we mean by the subscription economy and and how technology can help help support that yeah that would be great there we go very good so yes let's start a little bit with uh with uh, where subscription really is um is on the uprise um, from an overall point of view, if you look at the market, subscriptions actually started off uh, much earlier than, than software, as you see here on the left-hand side. Actually, it's something that's been around the block for, for a long time in media and newspapers and, and things of that nature for many, many decades. But uh, the software industry has really latched on in the recent years um, with the uprise of cloud capabilities and more serviceable components of software which would be much better uh, managed under a subscription umbrella, a subscription operational model. And that's where I think uh, we also focus on that, that industry very strongly. But besides that, over the last couple of years, subscriptions or as a service or servitization capabilities have grown at a, at a very fast rate around the world. Um, and one big part where we see a huge uh, traction at this point in time in the subscription economy is in the services uh, space which can branch out even into, uh, into production and manufacturing environments, where rather than focusing on outputs and let's say CAPEX kind of uh, models or one-time monetization models, companies are now much more focused on to actually ring fencing their offering as a subscription that encompasses everything that they do. So not only let's say manufacturing and selling a product or equipment uh, or service, and everything that goes with that uh, and selling that as against hours or against a product per price uh, per unit kind of scenario but actually saying like hey we want to bring this to our customers into an ongoing scenario building a lifetime relationship by for example adding uh, services and support that are that are continuous to their offerings and actually focusing on that and, and with that actually tying in a customer relationship for a much longer time and underneath that, running a subscription model that drives recurring revenue, but also continuous value for, for customers. So both in software and in services. But lastly, if you look at the market space for commerce and retail, uh, also in the last few years, many retailers also discovered subscription management as a mode of operation, um, where we often speak about the term box subscriptions meaning that, for example, you can buy your, your garments or your clothes or your makeup or cosmetics or uh, perhaps things like food uh, or wines and whiskey and things like that in a recurring fashion as well against a really affordable um, setup that leads to a, then to a continuous delivery of those goods like monthly or weekly, replenishing what you need as a consumer and where the retailer would actually not charge you for each individual transaction, but actually engage you in a continuous subscription scenario as well. Yeah. So from I'm that point of view, coffee subscriptions, that, that's uh, 
a big one. Yeah, the coffee is great one, right? I mean, I know yeah. you like coffee, Richard, and so do I. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you might like a whiskey or a beer as well or, or some good food. Yeah. And I think that also subscriptions are really on the uprise in that space also. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when we look at that, there's many reasons why, but I think if we look a little bit more generically, what it means for companies to uh, to onboard a subscription model or, or maybe they've already onboarded that, then I think the four things that really come to the surface uh, are, are, are on this uh, view here. So let me just take you through that. So the first thing is price, right? If you look at a subscription model, then usually you are engaging in a scenario where you will pay a, a monthly, a weekly, or a quarterly or yearly fee for a service or a usage uh, of a product rather than actually taking full ownership of that product. And that is actually uh, ultimately a cheaper scenario than buying a product or service outright for the longer term uh, due to the longevity of a subscription cycle. And the second part is about uh, subscriptions also taking a stance forward into more sustainable capabilities as well. A great example is, for example, electronic vehicles or, or e-bikes in cities, uh, where basically you can actually, rather than you buying a very expensive electronic vehicle or, or, uh, or, or bike, you can actually use that bike for a month or two months uh, and use only what you need and bringing that back. And that leads actually to a much more sustainable footprint uh, as well. I think Without Volvo's Volvo. got a uh, yeah Volvo got a, a pretty cool um, solution around that where where you can rent the Volvo um, you know the electricity comes for one of the electric ones the the electricity comes the insurance and you can just rent it for a few months and then give it back. That's uh, it. That's it. And I think it really also kind of alludes exactly what Volvo does. Um, and I think I've heard something like they want to be in 2030 completely uh, dependent on the revenue models around subscriptions for their vehicles. And that kind of leads us to the third component, which is personalization. So if you have, if you want to drive a Volvo, it could be that you want to take the wife out on Sunday and have a nice time and actually drive around in a cabrio. Whereas when you want to take the kids on a skiing trip, you want to actually have a larger SUV. Yeah, yeah. So that personal kind of components, that personalization that, that's out there, that Volvo is offering already, indeed, Richard, it's a really good point. But that, that really uh, also underlines the personalization that uh, that comes with subscriptions and really tailoring offerings to a client at the right point in time. And that subscription life cycle actually can therefore fluctuate in terms of what a client wants. Sometimes you want a different type of service or product, or, or you want more or less of it, uh, or maybe you don't want to use it for a particular point in time, like you want to pause it because of the fact you don't need it. And all those personal flavors in uh, are all encompassed in, in into a subscription over time. And that makes it unique as well. Um, and that drives actually also the last component, which is innovation. Um, innovation becomes much more uh, of a, a key factor in the subscription model because driving that recurring revenue stream allows you to have cash and have revenue to invest in continuous innovation, continuous upgrades, continuous diversification of your, of your, uh, of your personal capabilities to deliver something to a customer. And, that's, and that innovation part is also a key driver why many customers uh, and businesses out there uh, on board a subscription-based model. I, I guess the other the other one for me anyway is convenience. Um, yeah. Of all <laughs> yeah. These, right? So you know I've got a nine-week-old baby um, who's uh, going through going through not a lot of sleep at the moment. So funnily enough, my my coffee subscription has uh, has gone from once every uh, once a month to once every two weeks. Um, so, you know, I, I do think there's a, there's an element of that customer service in here, which you've, you've already spoken about, which for me, that, that's something that, that drives the subscription stuff for me. It's just easier. Um, yeah. As well yeah as, I, as think, well I, think, other stuff, right? I think it's spot on. And I think we can tie it likely up to the personalization capability yeah, that yeah. you have in your subscription. But I guess, you know, looking into that, um, a lot has to do with the fact that a subscription is not a one-off thing. It's a yeah. continuous relationship over time, and things change when time uh, moves along. Yeah. Uh, like in your case, I guess when your kids get gets a little bit older, then uh, you might switch to something else, and you might have other needs in terms of what you want to get out of that subscription as well, um, and move into a family plan or whatever yeah. that might be. So yeah, that, there's a lot of let's say that that flexibility and convenience uh, is a key driver for com for companies to jump on the subscription model. Yeah, and I guess the other bit, if you go back to Volvo, um, you know, for them, they would sell a car. Obviously, you've, you've got the upcoming, uh, the upkeep of the car. But 
somebody might hold on to that car depending on on their needs for a long time you know you see you see volvos out on the roads now that've been that've been around for for a very long time the very reliable car um so they can they, there's only so much money they can get from that one customer whereas actually having that subscription uh you know it's it's good for both sides uh, it's it does it does it's, it's a lifetime perspective that you need to have on each customer from from the get go all the way down to let's say a couple of years in the subscription cycle and in that customer relationship, which is really what I think it's all about, and, and focusing on, uh, on on how you can actually offer the right things at the right time to that customer. And I think that at the bottom line, if you look at it over a period of years, I think that the revenue that you generate and also the convenience that you provide against that revenue for the customer is, is much more of a dominant uh, factor as we go forward. Yeah, and that total lifetime value for that customer, that does seem to be a metric that, that seems to be coming up a lot more now. Absolutely. Um, you know, rather than that, you know, I, I, it's funny. I, I should stop calling it this, but I, I caught the good old days of of SaaS, of good old days of software, where you'd close a deal with a customer, uh, you'd get a, a load of margin from Microsoft. Uh, we'd all go out and, and drink lots of alcohol and be very happy. <laughs> where, whereas now, and but the risk really was on on the customer side, right? So it's the customer that just spent a million euros on on software. Whereas now that risk is is also being moved. So actually having that that relationship with the customer and keeping that ongoing is really important. And that's where your type of solution, uh, what you, what you do at Bluefort is really important because you're you're really giving a, a better experience to the customer and and helping enable that. Absolutely, and actually that that comes with uh, with let's say uh, with the, with a view on also how a subscription model. Uh, works from a transition point of view and it's, it's cool to see like indeed uh, back in our days when we were selling software per seat upfront in a capex model in a perpetual model for example as, as you just mentioned richard actually uh, transitioning to the cloud also comes with uh, with let's say this model you see here uh, meaning that if you start selling subscription the additional monetary value of a subscription initially is, is a heck of a lot lower than yeah. it used to be when you sell a capex deal and that that actually does uh, work towards a situation where you need to go to, let's say, a bit of a revenue valley, if you will, when you transition into a subscription model over time, which kind of represents that, that, that transition time yeah. um, that you need to go to, whereas at the same time, you will have an inflation of cost to, to, to make that transition and develop those offerings and those customer service and innovate them uh, in the light of the discussion we just had. And looking into that, the impact of those investments in those new capabilities during the transition time, um, uh, moving your to revenue and your customer experience into a subscription model and tying that in into long-term contracts actually does take some time. And once you get out of that on the other end, and looking at it from a starting state and then to an end state where your, your, your predominant revenue stream is recurring based on subscriptions, that does take time. And once you get out of there at the other end, at the end state, then um, we see that customers are, um, businesses are actually able to accelerate the growth a lot faster than they were able to before. Yeah. In the, let's say, the historical state where a, a business was more capex or perpetually um, revenue driven. And at the same time, since you, scale up, since, since you scale up using technology and innovation and customer experience capabilities, uh, where you give the steering wheel in terms of customer self-service um, to an end customer, leads also to much uh, better scalability of cost, labor cost, and other surrounding costs, and therefore results in a much better um, and healthy business model uh, as an outcome. Yeah, I know. Certainly um, thinking about it from my history with, uh, with eBex, uh, when we moved from the uh, on-prem to, to D365, um, you know, that was a discussion that, you know, the, that revenue will go down. And it was... Uh, painful and certainly you know we were lucky that we were a pretty decent sized uh, Microsoft partner with uh, you know enough money to to be able to go through that valley um, but I, I think you know not every partner was in that situation and there were definite definite uh, stories of partners really struggled to make the move which is why I think it was really interesting with uh, sort of the new entrance into into the Microsoft Dynamics world that that never had that they never had the legacy uh, revenue. You know, they weren't used to that that dopamine hit of a of a million euros a quarter just being dropped in software. You know, they they yeah. they never had that. So you know, it's it's a different it's a different model, uh, and and certainly one that hopefully 
uh, most most businesses are kind of over the other side of that valley now. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the key part is having an, having uh, to be successful in that, or 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 let's say the level of success. I think is uh, is really about you building that offering as a business to a client that really embraces the customer for a long period of time with mm -hmm. something that you know they really need at the, the beginning of a cycle and then continuously improving that to, to keep pace with the, the needs of a customer as we discussed uh, before as well so that you can also scale up and down on that uh, on what you provide to the customer in the life cycle of a subscription to really meet the needs of the client so they stay on board and you don't end up in customers churning out because at the end of the day they don't perceive the value anymore that they maybe initially perceived but later down the line they don't yeah. and, and therefore that innovation part to continuously add on new services new capabilities in a way where customers can easily and conveniently um, uh, uptake uh, then that offers new upselling capabilities like volvo allowing yeah. you for example to, uh, to to also incorporate things like repairs or replacements yeah. or you know slapping new winter tires on that winter all covered in the contract or maybe an additional fee uh, and actually being doing that proactively right not you have to call them but they tell you hey guys uh, you're hitting zero degrees now so you need winter tires today so why don't you come next week to pick them up yeah proactively those are the kind of things you need to consider uh, really growing this um, uh, your subscription model going not a problem you have in malta but i, I appreciate it <laughs> no we don't no we don't I'm in the no uk at the moment and it's about <laughs> to get cold so yeah i'm sure you may need to make a trip soon to get that done right <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So let's say if, if we if we dive a little deeper in that model and look at more towards let's say what we need. Um, I mean, you and I have been for a long time, Richard, in the EP CRM space, yeah. um, and we know a little bit more also about you know what our customers looking for in this model. And I think that uh, besides the business model being so different, uh, as we touched on, also our capabilities uh, with uh, the technology and applications we provide takes a, um, a, a pretty drastic turn as well in terms of what customers expect from solutions that we provide as well when it comes to subscriptions. And I think um, I'm, uh, let, I'm not going to let's say go into all the bits and pieces uh, that are out there, but I think a few things that I want to lift out is that uh, a commercial model of a subscription is very different than a, a non-subscription CAPEX or one-time commercial model. Uh, if you look at a subscription model, often we, you need to think about, okay, how do I monetize uh, uh, the right way? How do I come up with the right pricing models with the right uh, monthly prices? Should it be per user? Should it be consumption-based? Should it be a fixed plan with perhaps add-ons or not? Um, so there's many variations of how you can actually develop a commercial model. And that obviously puts a, um, a capability need into solutions that we provide as well. And I think the other part is that subscription also intrinsically has a lot of uh, transactional elements that you need to facilitate. That if you don't automate those transactional vehicles you need, think about revenue recognition, uh, think about uh, automatic capabilities for clients to up or uh, cross sell capabilities and buy them from you through a customer portal, and then having billing automation capabilities and so forth, automatically maybe procuring third party subscriptions you need in your offering. That needs to be very streamlined, otherwise you don't reach that level of scalability and, and you will fall flat on, uh, on running at a healthy margin as well. So automation is really an element that's kind of a must-have, which you see, for example, in companies like Tesla and also Volvo, where they really are developing capabilities where the backend process is highly automated. And that requires us to deliver elements around hyper-automation and really focusing on componentizing the process and making sure that things happen uh, with as little human touch as possible, yet still guaranteeing that the outputs are obviously correct, resulting in the right KPIs, like you mentioned before, customer lifetime value, um, but also things like average contract value, annualized recurring revenue, churn, retention rate, and so forth. Hmm. So those are a couple of key things. If, if we, let's say, push it along with, let's, let's looking at it from the perspective where subscription is really different, and we often talk about uh, the term lead to lifetime engagement <clears throat> in a subscription model that, that our end customers have with their customers. And this, this view uh, that, 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 uh, that's on the screen right now, and I'll just talk you quickly through that, kind of really illustrates that. Because on the one hand, you have a, a, a model where you run a subscription agreement 
for example, for three years, right? The client signs up for a three-year agreement or more or less. Uh, and within that, you need to then have a secondary life cycle that says, okay, I'm now billing monthly, quarterly, uh, yearly upfront in arrears for consumption-based models or not. So you need to model a secondary cycle for billing and consequent payment collection. And we do that very often with payment gateways, if it's like a low value, high volume subscriptions, um, or it could be a normal uh, um, order cash scenario for, for let's say high value subscriptions that are maybe more low volume. Um, but then you, you really see you have a contract cycle and a billing cycle. Then you have your revenue recognition cycles underneath that. And then underneath that, you need to look into like, okay, what are, are my entitlements or what am I actually providing to customers in terms of services? Do I deliver goods? Uh, in a periodic cycle underneath that? Or do I provide services uh, on a weekly basis that the customer has access to and all that as a fourth cycle? So basically that, that cycle breaks down in these four different things that you need to master in order to be successful running a subscription business model. And then within that cycle, it doesn't stop because the customer doesn't say like, okay, I buy one subscription and it never change. Typically as innovation kicks in, a subscription uh, re requires you to upgrade, upsell, cross-sell new capabilities that a customer might enroll into or not. Or maybe a client has the capability to downgrade. From uh, in, the, in terms of Volvo, uh, you've been driving six months in a nice SUV and then you think like, hey, this is too, uh, too much uh, of a running cost. I want to downgrade a little bit into a smaller vehicle, for example. And then you need to allow a customer to downgrade, which then really leads into impacts on revenue recognition and payments and service delivery and planning of the next steps and predicting the next things you need to do for a customer. So, um, and then we hit the renewal part and um, a renewal part might lead to indexations and price changes, or maybe you change your whole commercial model at one point in time before renewal. So there's a lot of timing um, uh, in the timing of a subscription lifecycle, there's lots of different events that you need to uh, control on a periodic basis uh, with different departments, spanning from finance to customer uh, support, um, to sales and so forth and operations that, that need to all adhere to that cycle because you cannot fall behind, right? You need to yeah, be yeah. in this continuous rhythm to, to, uh, to guarantee that, that high level of customer satisfaction. Absolutely, which is the most important thing, right? Because if they're not happy, they'll leave, and you know, and then you start from scratch again. So uh, that's it. That, that's it, and that, that, that's right. That this is such a critical component. And I think at the same time, when you look at a little back to what types of subscriptions you got out there, then uh, I think we all know our subscriptions for your mobile device, for apps that you have on yeah, your yeah. phone or in your house, or for the usage of uh, ongoing <laughs> utility bills and things like that. And I think more and more, especially in the UK and in the US, but, but more and more spending globally, you see that many uh, consumers have not only one or two subscriptions anymore, but multiple. And that leads to the fact that, uh, as you see at the, at the bottom a little bit, if you can see the slides, mm -hmm. just quickly alluding to that is that there's a, a huge variation in subscription contracts, right? I mean, yeah. it can be based on actually your consumption. So you need to calculate the consumption and gather all that and then build that in arrears over a period of time or you build up front, or maybe you have a hybrid model between them. Uh, you, it could be a delivery model of, uh, of goods that you provide, like uh, an office where you would send uh, 10 bottles of water and, and, and lunch maybe, or something like that, mm. for staff. And obviously staff can grow or, or, or shrink over time, so that also fluctuates. So there's a lot of different types of subscription models and contracts to master. And even, for example, one thing we've seen a lot as well is that companies themselves might have a lot of subscriptions that they acquire from their suppliers. Eh? Think about big customers, and we've we counted them both in the days, that have an enterprise agreement with Microsoft. Yeah, that yeah. could be like hundreds of lines on a yearly basis that you need to budget for. And, and, and doing that, you need to also master your inbound subscriptions from suppliers as well. Just to give a view on, on how widespread subscriptions are, is becoming these days in the subscription economy. Yeah, I know. I. I, I... I can't even think of the number I have. It's between, you know, just media, right? So Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon, um, Paramount Plus, um, and that's just, oh, and then you've got Apple Music. So that, that's just five there, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah it's, uh, it's amazing sometimes uh, how, how, uh, how we got already so accustomed to, uh, to, to living in a subscription-based subscription society. Yeah. 
And I think, let's say, if we if we flip a bit more to from a Blue Fort point of view, um, taking all these uh, elements into consideration um, and all these uh, in complexities that need to sit under the hood for a business that, uh, yeah. that, that requires subscriptions from our customers. Uh, basically, what we've done is um, we've taken the dynamic stack forward, both in Business Central, in financial operations, uh, as the, the two EAP systems that we've, yeah. that we've built on top of, but also on the customer engagement side, um, we, we've extended elements like customer service, uh, post operations, sales, and of course selling a subscription is, is, is also fundamentally different than selling a, a one-off uh, scenario with a different data model with different timelines. So we really uh, want to make sure that our solution as an ISV that's born in the, in the cloud apps of Dynamics, uh, we didn't have that legacy of, uh, of the on-prem apps and, and the different types of technologies that we were used to back in the days. And that has really pushed us to, uh, to onboard all the different capabilities, uh, even into, for example, using Power Automate and uh, robotic process automation to, for example, deploy solutions after a client signs up for a subscription. And really taking that last mile forward into uh, automating parts on, on that operational component as well. And we, we've, we've done that with actually our, our hyper automation solution, which we call HARP, that sits underneath all our subscription solutions um, uh, from a Bluefoot point of view. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, are, you, are you seeing any? Um, so, obviously, therefore, you cover both uh, small to mid market and uh, upper mid market enterprise. So, you've got pretty wide. A uh, wide group of customers. Are, are you seeing a particular um, take up in any one particular place or around the uh, subscription model? Um, actually, yes, uh, we've seen an, uh, a really big uptake in, um, in in larger SaaS companies with with okay. financial operations or tech companies. But we've ventured into business central for small and medium enterprise as well, in conjunction yeah. with, uh, with with CRM solutions in Dynamics uh, 365 customer engagement. For companies that are actually rapidly growing as a startup, right? But they yeah. don't want to let, they have a really uh, fully fleshed ERP yet, since they're not on that level of maturity and they don't have all the needs that uh, that you find typically in larger companies. And then, then Business Central is a great solution that's quickly up and running. And we also want to make sure that those customers in a startup scenario uh, running a subscription based recurring business model could benefit from our, our capabilities as well. Yeah. Well, it's great that you're able to answer the need across a very wide, uh, wide range of, of customers, right? Because I yeah. think a, a lot of the a lot of the technology that's out there is is geared for I don't know, for the enterprise, right? Because it is complex. Because you need the ability to do many different things. So, uh, being able to do both uh, small, mid market, and uh, enterprises is, is really cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, and I, and I think that was exactly also the reason why we invested in. A more holistic approach in the Dynamics 365 stack to be able to um, to service many customers onboarding subscription capabilities um, uh, based on, on the, the stack effectively. Yeah. Alrighty, so I think I think one thing, Richard, also that uh, that, that obviously from a Blue Fork point of view, we're very happy with is uh, is our partnership between uh, between Share and, and Blue Fork. And I think that has given us the capability to uh, to extend the value proposition that we have already from a solutions point of view and an EFT and CRM coverage point of view into actually um, also kind of looking at it in a, in a way where we can work with our partners and end customers in a uh, more customer satisfying way, a more convenient way, as we just discussed, right? With, uh, with offering our partners capabilities where they can, with uh, Guide 365, uh, discover and our capabilities that we added to, to the platform to much faster also and more standardized also work with uh, end customers and really get them on board quickly by running a fast fit gap analysis and, and running a quick um, a quick process into like understanding uh, what the customer needs and how that looks like from a, from a rough order of magnitude and project estimations and then drive that ultimately into a more standardized way of deploying our solutions as well which are, is all, also part of our, it's really also part of the subscription way of thinking. And I think that's where we really joined forces and, and partnered up. And uh, yeah, that, that was leading to some, some uh, really great engagement already that we see with our partners and end customers. And um, as we see that, uh, that for them, you know, self-servicing themselves by getting uh, the survey, work, working their way through it with the subscription customers, 
being able to, to master all requirements in a very fast way, uh, in the fast world we live in, uh, as such, is really helping us to, uh, to, to engage with our partners in a better and more standardized way, so that they ultimately can also grow their footprint um, with, uh, in a subscription space as well, uh, with, with the capabilities we have now, which is really cool. And I think, if I may, let's say, look a little bit to, to the partner channel out there that we, uh, that we engage with and that we want to engage with as we go forward. Um, yeah, our offering obviously uh, ventures into the capabilities that we jointly created in terms of uh, running standardized discovery and uh, design um, uh, cycles together in a structured and highly automated fashion. And that rolls also up into our partner agreements as well to our partners out there in Dynamics. Uh, 365 and, up, and obviously as you can expect Richard our partner plans are also all subscription based yeah good uh, just, yeah, that, I mean, you have to kind of drink your own champagne there as well of course yeah at the same time in that customer approach that we have for our partners or the partner approach I will then our plans our subscription plans you see uh, uh, moving from ambassador into reseller into insider plan are also tailored to engage much more profoundly as we uh, uh, win more business in the subscription economy at the same time, our partners can also benefit by onboarding our solutions for Business Central, CE, and uh, FinOps as well, uh, against a heavily um, discounted fashion with uh, internal user rights that we can provide to them once they sign up with them, and obviously use the CR365 capabilities within there as well, which I think is uh, is really uh, striking a good tone with our partners. And uh, at the moment, we're we, we're really moving forward on engaging and recruiting new partners in that fashion. Thanks, Bjorn, and look. Um, you know, the, the point is to put a high uh, spotlight on you, but uh, very kind of you to mention uh, Sear as well. And thanks, thanks as always for, for your partnership, really, really appreciate it and, and love working with you. Uh, even though you do love Max Verstappen, uh, I, I do have to put that to one side. Um, but you know, I'm uh, definitely team Lewis Hamilton on, on my side, but there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see what we'll see what Suzuka ends up looking like, but we'll, we'll get there. Cool. Sure. Thanks, so, so thank you. So, um, those of you that are watching this uh, on on a, either live or recorded on on LinkedIn, you will see all the uh, the URLs there. Uh, how to get in contact with Bluefoot? Um, as I said, a great ISV and a you know for me a real um, a real exam a really great example of a modern ISV, a Microsoft um, partner, uh, really helping to to make others better. And I think um, you know that that's something that we see in all the best uh, partners at the moment who, who really do their best to to make others successful. Um, so Bjorn, thank you very much again uh, for for coming in and uh, spending some time with us. Um, you know, I, I think for those of you who would like to get hold of Bjorn, he's on uh, LinkedIn, so I've got his uh, URL there um, to to get in touch with Bjorn. Um, but I just want to end uh, this session by saying thanks again to Bjorn and everybody at Bluefort, uh, both for coming on to the SEER session and also for your continued partnership. Um, this session, uh, again, is uh, recorded, but also will be available on, on LinkedIn, I think, for pretty much perpetuity. There will also be a, a podcast as well uh, called the SEER Sessions, um, and that will be available on uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, but uh, and we'll be back next Thursday, where at two p.m. UK time, uh, where we got the Infinity Group, who've been talking about how they've changed the way that they implement projects uh, in a SaaS in a SaaS model. So you know, how do they actually do the projects in a in a different way to, as I once called it, the good old days? But I'm going to have to get over it at some point soon. So I'm going to end that. Thanks very much, Bjorn. I really appreciate your time, and I hope everybody right has a great week. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.